So somewhere in that crazy mind of yours, you decided it would be a good idea to cross the country by bike. But where do you get started, you ask? Well, you've come to a good place. Juliana and I finished our bike trip across the country not that terribly long ago. And we've got a few ideas we'd like to share with you about where you might be able to find some ideas and inspiration of your own. Because even though you could take off from just anywhere and go where the wind takes you, you know, with something as epic as a cross-country trip, you know, you might want to do a little planning. It might make it more interesting, it might make it a little bit more fun. So in this video, I'm going to walk through some of the inspirations that we got, maps, apps, then in the second video, I want to walk through what our actual route was, how it worked for us, and mistakes that we made, uh, so that maybe you won't have to. All right, one mile down. 3,999 to go. Here we go. Here we go. Woo! But first, if you've enjoyed our videos, our epic and not so epic adventures, just smash that subscribe button for us. That would be really awesome. And you know, always hit like. It's always nice to know that we're popular. Anyway, I've had the idea for a cross-country bike trip, you know, in my head for a very long time. I mean, ever since I was a teenager, hitchhiking my way up the Pacific coast and I ran into some cyclists who were doing the Bike Centennial. Now to give you some context, the Bike Centennial was a huge event back in 1976, uh, which was our country's bicentennial. Bike Centennial, Bicentennial, nice little play on words. And folks were encouraged uh, to ride their bikes across the country. It was enormously popular. The people who put it on became Adventure Cycling, which is probably the world's leader in bike touring, information, literature, mapping, infrastructure. I mean, they create routes all across the country, create routes north to south, east to west. Um, it's a not-for-profit. I've been a member for many years, and it's a resource that you should probably get familiar with if you're not already. Anyway, back to the coast of California. I met these people who were biking across the country, and they were so charged up by it that they were going to go ahead and ride their bikes down the Pacific Coast. And I'm, you know, just some schmuck who's got his thumb out hitchhiking. Back in the day, that was kind of a cool thing to do. And I couldn't even imagine the idea of biking across the country. And I thought, what an incredible idea. And it planted a seed. And, you know, it wasn't probably until 45 or 50 years later that, uh, that I had time and a frame of mind to embark upon my own journey. And so I've had a lot of time to think about it. So the first question is, you know, where do you go? West, east, north, south? I mean, it's a big country. You know, you're gonna need to start looking at maps. You're gonna wanna open up those big paper maps and get a big idea. But of course, you can go any direction you want. You wanna go east to west, it's totally fine. I mean, you wanna go west to east, again, great. North, south, you know, you can take the Great Divide Trail along the Continental Divide, or you can do the Pacific Coast Tour and have the ocean to your side the whole time, all the way down from Canada to Mexico. You can also take the East Coast Greenway, which goes from Maine down to Key West and Florida, all along the Eastern Seaboard. Lots of north-south options as well. We're going to focus more on west to east, because that's the direction that we took, and we wanted to go from ocean to ocean, and we did go west to east for the winds. You've probably heard that due to prevailing winds, west to east is best. We found that to be true. We had tailwinds a lot of the way across the country, and even when it was windy, it was generally in our favor. Huge plus, uh, makes it so much nicer. This tailwind is magnificent, and it just feels like we're flying. What you need to do, open up that great big map of the U.S. and just get the big picture. You know, you want to cross the desert? Where do you want to cross the desert? In the south, in the north? You want to cross the Rockies, you know, through Colorado where the passes are high and the elevation is high? Or do you want to do it in New Mexico where the passes are very low or Montana? So every route you take has pluses and minuses. The idea is get that big picture, you know, maybe you want to ride with the ocean next to you the whole time. Maybe you want to ride through urban areas. It's where you get your big picture. Then it's time to start getting into some details. Now as bicycle tourists, we have so many 
incredible tools at our fingertips. I mean, the folks who biked the bicentennial back in 76, they were in comparison living in the Stone Age. I mean, now we have iPhones, which brings us Google Maps, and that's an incredible tool for finding day-to-day -day planning. I mean, the cycling component on Google Maps is really outstanding. They have a great algorithm to help you find routes that are not only you know low traffic, but maybe wide shoulders. The thing about Google Maps, though, is that they'll kind of find the shortest route. If you want to, say, go see something more scenic, or if you want to do a climb, or if you want to avoid a climb, you have to kind of play around with it. No AI program is better than your own human mind. So, so I spoke too quick about uh, Google Maps. They've uh, routed us onto this road here, and it is nothing but grass. There's, the cornfield. There's, Thank a, you, Google. there's a road sign way down there, so it was a road not too long ago, but ain't a road now, that's for sure. One of the great things about Google Maps is the Google Man, and you know that you can drop the Google Man down on little pieces of the highway where you think you might want to go, and you can kind of see. Does it have a shoulder on it? Or is there no shoulder? Is there a lot of traffic? And if you're looking at it and you see a lot of traffic, you know that's probably going to be too highly trafficked for you or whatever. But you can get a sense of what the climbs look like and all that other kind of stuff. Kamut is another app. We used it in Europe a lot, and we started using it a lot more in the United States as well. And by the time we were done with our trip, that was our exclusive app. Uh, they just found us so many really nice routes. Again, it's not perfect, but they have different components for bike touring or road cycling or for mountain biking. So, you know, you find your own route. If you're bike packing, you might want to use the mountain biking tool, but we used bike touring and that kept us mostly on roads, but it accepted the idea that sometimes we might be riding on gravel and that kind of stuff. So we like, you know, those out of the way roads, it definitely found those kinds of roads for us and did a beautiful job and found routes through its algorithm cyclists really, really like. Other online maps that are going to be really handy for you to use, we use the smoke and fire map that was put together by the EPA and the National Forest Service. It can be really handy when you're, say, in Montana and there's wildfires springing up all over the place. Wouldn't go as far as to say the smoke is cleared but we actually are getting some sun through the haze, which is very heartwarming. You want to know, you know, where the smoke is drifting or you want to know which roads to avoid. In our case, you know, we found some roads were closed due to fire and roads that we wanted to take. Of course, weather maps are huge. Another great tool that you have with your iPhone, you can pull up the weather at any time. And, uh, you know, we might want to book a room for a couple of days to try to avoid riding in downpour situations. I guess it's good we're not riding. Wouldn't you say? <laughs> also, obviously, if it's really, really hot, you might want to, you know, reschedule your day so that you're riding earlier in the day. It's a great tool to have. Then when you're long-range planning, I think it's really handy to use the uh, monthly climate stats wherever you're going. Let's say you're going to ride through Winnemucca, Nevada in the middle of July. Well, those climate maps may tell you maybe not such a good idea. So very, very handy in terms of, you know, getting that big schedule going. I think another big question is, how do you want to travel? If you want everything planned out in advance, go to adventurecycling.com. The link is uh, below in the, in the description. They have maps, paper maps, or digital GPX uh, downloads. Places to stay, places to camp, places to eat, bike repair. So they can show you all along your route and they'll tell you exactly where you're gonna go. You're gonna follow their route all the way through. You can literally travel day by day without ever having to think too hard about navigation and you know wondering where you're gonna have to go next because they'll basically tell you they'll they'll lead you all along the way and they have tons of routes lots of options it really takes the guesswork out of it it's a fine choice that's used by by many many people downsides i would say they don't exactly plan it to be easy with elevation for example the trans america which is probably the most popular coast-to-coast -coast bike route they have three of them the northern tier 
southern tier and the Transamerica Trail. Transamerica Trail, I mean, that's like 220,000 feet, I think, of elevation gain across the country. They find places where there's a lot of climbing. Great if that's what you're into, but if that's not what you're into, you might want to think about other options. I have to officially say this is the hardest climb I have ever done. With this load, uh, it is, um, it just kicks our butts. Maybe you want to take rail trails. I mean, rail trails are built on old railroads, so the grades are gentle and the climbing is fairly minimal. And also they keep you away from traffic, which is awesome. Give you the space you need to look around and enjoy your surroundings. Well, they're just a lot more relaxing than riding on roads. And a great resource there is traillink.com. That's the trail finding component of railstotrails.org great not-for-profit that I've been a member of for many, many years. And they have something like 2,500 completed rail trails at this point for over 25,000 miles of trail riding. Now, a lot of those are short little trails, but there's a ton of really long distance trails and they're growing all the time, all across the country. And we used rail trails a lot, both for the fact that it minimized climbing in areas, but also because it was just a lot safer a lot more chill. You know, speaking of rail trails, there's this new thing called the Great American Rail Trail that railstotrails.org has put together. And they're pushing it as a route across the country. It's a collection of existing trails with lots of gaps in between. It's less than 50% completed. So what you're gonna find is you're crossing the country on the Great American Rail Trail. Uh, there's dead ends and there's stops and there's no explanation for how to get from one trail to the next. I mean, you have to figure it out by yourself. They're not really creating a route, they're creating a concept for a route so that states can start building their rail trails to connect them. But you know, how long will that take? 30 years, 50 years, it's a long ways from being complete. Big, big stretches where there's just no, no real significant trail at all. You know, the other thing that's interesting about the, uh, the Great American Rail Trail is that it, it misses a lot of the really nice long distance bike trails that are already there. The Katy Trail in Missouri isn't part of it. Parts of uh, uh, the Ohio to Erie, the Mickelson and the Black Hills, um, or even the Erie Canal in New York, which is like 350 miles of off-road, really nice trail, not part of the system. You can create your own just as well as using theirs. I would definitely look at customizing if you wanted to go that route. A trail that's too often overlooked, I'd say, for cycling tourists is the American Discovery Trail. It's kind of interesting in that it doesn't just stick to rural areas. It definitely goes through cities, starts in San Francisco, goes through Denver, goes through Cincinnati. Um, I think there's parts of it, certainly here in Colorado, where you're talking about mountain biking. It is a long trail. It's at least 5,000 miles, whichever way you take it. But it's a really interesting route. I would look into that myself. As you're planning your route, you want to be thinking about your sleeping preferences. If you want a soft bed every night, well then you're talking about hotel to hotel. And that's not always easy to do in places like the West, where towns are few and far between. A couple we met when we were in Washington had made it all the way from the East Coast, staying in hotels every single night. And my guess is that they probably had to put in some really long days to make that happen. In any case, it takes a fair amount of strategic planning to make that work. The same is true if you want to do campgrounds where there might be showers. You know, we wanted to stay in campgrounds where we could take a shower every night. That always feels so good after a shower. Here's our campsite in the woods of uh, Illinois. And that's not always easy. The campgrounds aren't always on the route that you're on. Usually what we would do in the morning, we would look ahead, find places where we could stay, either book a room or get a campsite. Uh, just for one night, yeah. But sometimes even then that's not possible. Things happen during the day and you can't make it that far. So we camped about half the time when we were in the west. In the eastern half of the country, we stayed a lot more in hotels. Why? Part of it was the weather. If it was really hot and muggy in the east, you know, it doesn't cool off at night like it does in the west. And so you're laying in your sleeping bag or you're laying on top of your sleeping bag in your tent, uh, keeping the mosquitoes out and it's just muggy and it's hot and it's sticky and it's very uncomfortable. By the time you get up in the morning, 
your sleeping bag is soaking wet, the tent is soaking wet from all the dew. You gotta dry all that stuff out. It takes a long time. It is a uh, very humid morning. Everything was wet this morning. Just the dew point was high, low, something. So we just found that in the east, it was kind of a mess to camp especially during the summer months. And then later on, a lot of the campgrounds were closing down. So we just found ourselves relying more and more on hotels. Finally, there's wild camping. And we did this on rare occasions when we really needed to. Looks like we finally found our first wild camping. It used to be a railroad camp from what I can tell. Just lay it out here in the grass. Just find a place in the woods and set up camp, you know, wherever we happen to be. In the west, it's not bad because there's lots of public land. There's national forest land, there's BLM. But in the east, it's not so much public land. So usually you're trespassing when you're wild camping. And that's probably adds a layer of stress that most people don't want to deal with. In my younger days, I would have done a lot more wild camping, I think. Nowadays, try to find a shower every night. Not always possible. We've got a uh, like a 40, 50 mile ride tomorrow and there's a hotel on the other end. Time to clean ourselves up. Because this is, you know, we're not, we're kind of classy people. For sleeping on a sidewalk, I mean anyway. <laughs> Part of planning is choosing your timing in terms of the season and the time of the year. Some riders are fine crossing the mountains in the middle of winter and in the blizzard. Others will ride across Nevada in the middle of summer. But most of us want a more comfortable climate when they're riding. We left Washington in July, later than we wanted to, and uh, we were blessed with beautiful weather in the Pacific Northwest because it doesn't tend to rain a lot there in the summer. But by the time we reached Montana, we were dealing with temperatures over 100 degrees and wildfires everywhere and smoke everywhere. And that sun behind us, that is a smoky sun. If I was to plan a ride in the southern part of the country, like the southern tier, I'd probably leave in late winter or early spring. I wouldn't want to be crossing Alabama. I wouldn't want to be crossing the Mojave in the middle of summer. So, you know, you really do want to time it. That gets back to the whole climate research that you want to do as you're, as you're doing your big, big plan. Consider how many miles you want to do in a day at your pace. Extrapolate that over time. You know, you're probably going to want to get a rest day at least once a week. And then, you know, kind of pace that out. Is it going to take you three months? Is it going to take you four months? Is it going to take you two months? And uh, then you can start to see, well, I'll be here at this time of the year. I'll be here at this time of the year. And it makes a big difference. You're going through really hot weather, really rainy weather, or hurricane season, tornado season. It all matters. So you just want to kind of be aware and you want to plan. In any case, I mean, the weather's not going to be too big of a deal, probably. You'll be able to handle it. During hot weather, we rode in the morning and we rested in the afternoon. You know, when it was raining, we tried to time our rest days to rain days. Of course, if it's a soft rain, nothing more beautiful than riding through a soft rain. Just be aware and kind of plan for it and, and know what you're getting into. So here we are, sitting outside in our hotel. It's raining, but we've got this lovely bottle of wine and this lovely bench, this lovely man. <laughs> and we're just enjoying our romantic little evening. Gotta make the best of life. Let's find the magic. Plan your route with elevation in mind. We prefer fewer hard climbs. But the Transamerica Trail, for example, has over 200,000 feet in elevation gain across its length. That's a lot of gain. And beware, like a lot of that climbing is not necessarily in the Rockies. It's also the Appalachians are notorious for being very hilly and lots of tough climbs. We found a lot of hard climbing in Indiana. It's hard to show how steep these hills are, but they're just, they're, they're brutal. If you do decide that you want to take more rail trails, just know that that elevation is going to diminish significantly, and you can tell that on your map as you're building your routes. If you do route through Colorado, it's not only elevation gain that you've got to be concerned about, but it's elevation period. You might start that climb at 8,000 feet and it doesn't finish until 12,000 feet. Well, 4,000 feet is a lot of climbing with all your gear, but at 10,000 feet, it's brutal. 
and if you're not used to it it's going to really tax you so just be aware that that elevation definitely takes a different level of energy than it does you know at sea level well, we crossed the rockies in montana and the pass that we went over i think was lower in elevation than the city we live in in denver that elevation gain is generally a colorado problem much less so in other states so what does it take to cross the country? If I bike three to 4,000 miles of riding, probably 75 to 250,000 feet of climbing, probably two to four months of riding, depending on the kind of shape and how fast you want to go. Um, of course, you can take longer if you want to. And our suggestion is take your time. You know, spend less time on the bike and more time talking to strangers. Take breaks often and enjoy the towns that you ride through and that you stay at. When you ride by a stream or a lake, pull over. Dip your feet in, cool your feet off. Feel, feel your surroundings. You can bust out centuries in your own neighborhood and in your own hometown. In my opinion, crossing the country by bike is not about busting out the miles. It's really about the experience. And so, take your time. This is all about falling in love with your country again. Just let it kind of seep into you. If you rush through it, it's going to be more like that interstate riding. The bottom line is, no matter which route you take, you're going to have an epic experience. And I do mean epic. It's going to blow your mind. It's going to be one of the most incredible experiences of your entire life. And the more planning you do, the more you can change your plans on the fly. Knowledge is power. So we've changed our mind. We're gonna go ahead and take the Northern Rail Trail. It's gonna add a few miles, but it's gonna reduce risk. Risk and also climbing. Yeah. There are three ways to make a difficult decision. One is to analyze it to death. Two is to just go with your gut. And three is to analyze it to death and then go with your gut. And that's what we did. A lot of planning gave us the ability to, when we wanted to change our mind, we were able to make quick decisions. So we covered a few ideas about how you can plan your next trip, but enough about you. Let's talk about us. In our next video, we're gonna be talking about our route, why we chose it, what really, really worked, what really, really didn't, what mistakes we made, and uh, ultimately how incredibly well it all turned out for us. Until then. Happy trails. Happy trails, let's ride. A new day, a new adventure. Here we go, crossing the country.